What's up guys? It's yo boy on the sensei. Welcome to, what if a martial arts master transmigrated into Tai Lung? Part 5, like share and comment on the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't subscribed. Also remember to check out the original story, link in the description. With all that out of the way, enjoy. Tai Lung's POV. I had a serious talk with Shifu right before I came back to Gongmen to protect it from the Allied Army. I remembered when I first became a general, he said whenever I needed help in my conquest, the Jade Palace was there for me. He and his students were ready to help me, even if it meant destroying the traditional neutrality of the Jade Palace. So I put him up to the task. Before I left the Jade Palace, I asked Shifu to let the students come to Gongmen City so that they could help the citizens if I were to fail. In a sense, they were not actually helping me, since the Jade Palace is always on the people's side, but I called it that anyway. That might come as a surprise to some people, since I had the mentality that I was invincible, and I could do anything. But there was a fine line between believing in yourself and being stupid and delusional. So I had a backup plan in case I was not able to bear the might of three great powers slash kingdoms. I asked you all to ensure the safety of the people if I failed. But since I did not, I no longer need your help. I said to the six young warriors in front of me. We were currently inside the main tent of the Gongman army. Oh come on Poe wind, this an opportunity for me as the dragon warrior. I have to punish the three kingdoms for breaking the codes. To hear Poe begging to be allowed to participate in a war, would not have crossed anyone's mind from my other world. But things were not always as innocent as it appears to be. Poe was still young and like any young warrior, he wanted fame and glory. Poe in specific wanted to be awesome, and his model of an awesome warrior was me. He was still young, and had not developed his pacifist ideals. I agree, the enemies are still too much, and while I have no doubt that you will come out victorious no matter the numbers, it will take you a great amount effort. Tigris said, please let us help you. You make a good point, but you are still a student of the Jade Palace. You can't pick a side in a war like this. I said with a shake of my head, we are not just students of the Jade Palace, we are also your students. She persisted and the others nodded. And when has a student helping their master ever been wrong? I revealed a small smile of amusement. Um, Crane hummed, he had something to say and he raised his wing in obvious nervousness. What is it, Crane? The problem you have seems to be that you don't want us to pick a side when the Jade Palace has always stayed neutral, right? Yes. But why does that even matter when you are going to unite China soon? I opened my mouth, but no words came out. He was right, why even bother with the tradition, if I was going to unite the whole of China anyway? All eyes were on me, they were hopeful they were all warriors and they all wanted to fight alongside me and help in any way they could. I thought about it for a few more seconds before I decided, why not? It will be a good experience for them, and it will be a good chance to see how much progress they have made. Fine. Yes. X6. The Furious Five joined us in the war, and with that, our force had been substantially enhanced. There was also a reinforcement that came from Shu in the form of six airships, that contained hundreds of soldiers, and most importantly, cannons and bombs. The Allied army took four days to soak up their defeat and to recover completely. After that, with the order from their respective king, they marched towards us again. But with all of the reinforcement that we had coupled with the fact that they had lost all of their big players, it was a downhill battle for them. They fought for the sake of order. Even they didn't believe they would win. Nevertheless, their forces were great in number. So it took an entire two weeks to mow them down and for them to make an official surrender. I used the two weeks to improve my new techniques such as fire bending and conqueror's haiki. It also served as a great teaching ground for my students. During the war, Poe in specific seemed to learn many things, and that included the aspect of the mind and spirit. During this time, I also heard the great news that the kingdom of Nanzao had been conquered by Shen and his army, with most of their forces here and their greatest warrior, Mighty Eagle, being reduced to a cripple. They stood no chance against Shen and his newfound invention of airships. Two weeks later, you shall all return to Gongman City. Rejoice soldiers, you have done a marvelous job. You fought against impossible odds and came out victorious. I addressed the remaining soldiers as the war had officially ended and won. The city shall welcome you like the heroes you are. Enjoy yourself, you all deserve it. I said and allowed a rare genuine smile to appear on my face. The six of you as well, 
You have done a great job, and your help was appreciated. But now it's time for you to return to the Jade Palace. I said and they nodded. But what about you? Monkey asked after raising his hand. Are you coming with us or with them? I have uh, some unfinished businesses to attend to. I said, everyone... I will see you in the next battle. Then I leapt into the air and used flash steps to blitz across the sky. I flew towards the east and my destination was the kingdom of Dali. There was one conversation I had with Shen in the past. I said if the enemy ever stop respecting the codes of war, I will make sure they regret it by dropping into their main capital and turning it to hell. Refer to chapter 65, I am a leopard of my words. The warriors had paid the price, but now it was time for the main people behind the attack to sow the same semicolon. The kings, the nobles and the generals of the kingdoms. They all had exhausted most of their forces in the battle, and they won't have time to react if I suddenly dropped into their city. Shen had also already conquered the kingdom of Nanzu, so it's finally time to take over a kingdom by myself. Third POV The city of Xiaguan was the capital city of the kingdom of Dali. It was located in the eastern part of the region, and it was selected as the capital because the king and most of the nobles lived here, and because of its connection with the Silk Route. Xiaguan was one of the main trading hubs of the Dali Kingdom, and many of the mining sites were located in this city. The economic backbone of the Kingdom of Dali was mining minerals like gold, agriculture which was possible due to the Erhai Lake, and finally trade with Southeast Asia. Xiangwen was a city where all these three trade flourished. It was a city which was almost twice as big as Gongmen City, due to the sheer number of citizens gathering in this city full of opportunity. Like any metropolis city with a bustling economy, Xiangwen was a great city with stunning infrastructure and impressive architecture. Due to its mining trade, there were many buildings made of silver and ornaments of gold. The city was always lively and never seemed to sleep. From late midnight to early in the morning, the city was always bustling with activity. The people of Xiangwen were not as diverse compared to the likes of Gongmen City and Mylan City. The residents were made up entirely of the feline family, cat family, Seeing another species was a rare sight, and most of the time they were visitors. But even then, most of the visitors were also feline, as there exists discrimination against other races in the city. If you were a trader of another species coming to Xiaguan in search of opportunity, you would find yourself unable to sell your products properly and in the worst case, publicly robbed. Due to this reason, although Xiaguan was a great trading hub, its economy could never rival the likes of Gongmen City. It was like every other day. The sun was high in the sky, shining down on the great city without discrimination, unlike the citizens. The chilling air of the night had now become hot and humid. The city was especially busy ever since the alliance between the three kingdoms. Because the alliance was not only military but also trade. So the city finds itself with a diverse selection of animals and more people in this particular morning. But as life was ongoing, a threat loomed over the city. The people were unaware, yet the world seemed to foretell the disaster as dark clouds blocked the sun. The disaster came flying towards the city like a relentless storm. And when it was above the city, it dropped. Boom, it crashed right at the heart of the city like a meteorite. Its thunderous explosion turned the head of every citizen. The busy city was stunned into silence as a powerful presence filled the space. The people thought maybe the sun itself had descended on the earth. It was suffocating. The city was about to pay the price for the mistake of its king. Judgment has come. Tai Lun's POV I looked around the city of Xiaguan with a face void of any emotion. My landing had left a crater on the ground, and my surrounding was destroyed by the shockwave. The dust settled, and so did the silence. The people of the city which were mostly felines, were rooted on their spot at the side of my visage. Move get away quickly. The guards were quick to arrive at the scene, and they pushed away the civilians. But they too, froze like a statue when they saw me. They knew who I was, so they dared not move. Their body just gave up before their mind, and their instincts restricted movement because it knew. That was the best move to survive. No movement. Hello there. I greeted them all with a small smirk on my face. Without my permission, there was no sound. There was no movement, and there was no hope. Then I moved, which looked like I teleported in their eyes. I appeared in front of the two guards, and I grabbed their cat faces before I planted their heads to the ground, and buried them between cracks and craters. Boom. I was crouching down so I looked up and my eyes flashed yellow. Run. With my permission, there was sound and movement. Chaos descended on the city. Tai Lung is here. He is here he is going to kill you us all. I tease Tai Lung quote. I did not know what was wrong with being a civilian and running away while screaming, but it helped notify the others of what was going on, so I guess it was fine. Just as the villains were running away, the guards of the city ran towards me. They knew they had no chance. They knew I held the power of an entire kingdom. And they knew they would die. But they fought anyways. 
they protected the city and fulfilled their duty. Because what does a warrior do when faced with certain death? If it meant buying time for one citizen to escape, they were happy to throw their lives away. It was why I always held respect for warriors. They may run away in a war where they fight to obtain something. But when it came to protecting what they loved, they were willing to die. I took a long stride and slowly walked towards the king's castle. The guards rushed at me, but I was easily able to take them down and sent their body flying away to crash into buildings. I let them destroy what they were trying to protect which was the city. I made sure to not kill the civilians though. I have standards. They were mostly feline, so their escape was swift, and they were nimble enough to save their lives if I was not targeting them. But the luxurious city made of gold and silver, I brought it to ruin. The soldiers were not many, barely numbering in hundreds, and whatever strategy they tried like crashing a building on top of me it did not work. They can never do what 200,000 of them could not. The screams of the civilians, the battle cry of the city guards and the explosion of buildings collapsing on each other made for a chaotic and frightening sound. The city could do nothing but fall on its knees under my single might. I was a farmer, sowing fear and mayhem to the city. This will forever be etched in the hearts of the people, and it will act as an example. Burn. I said and blue flames erupted from my body like hellfire. The city started catching on fire as heat pulsated out in waves, melting the buildings and turning the solid earth into liquid lava. The guards could no longer even come close to me, so they opted to get out of the city as quickly as they could while also helping all the people get to safety. For a long time now, people have spread rumors about how I went on a rampage in the city and how I destroyed everything. But now, it was for real. I showed them what it was like when I really went on a rampage. I raised my arms, and the flames obeyed my gesture. The fire rose up like a wave in the ocean and swallowed everything. The sound of flames burning was enough to rupture an ear. The air trembled due to the heat, and the blue flames sapped everything of its life and glory. I raised my other arm and the same scene replayed. Then as I stepped on the ground it cracked and broke into a million pieces before it turned scorched. I paved the road leading to the castle in hell. I stopped using fire bending and left the city to burn itself to the ground as I entered the castle. There was no one inside as all of the guards and maids had left. But my sense did pick up one person in the throne room, so I made my way there with unhurried steps. The castle was extremely luxurious and filled with golden furniture crafted with exceptional artistry. But everything looked dead and depressing in the emptiness. When I entered the throne room, I was met with the King of Dali, who was sitting proudly on the throne with his best attire. He was a lion with a body that you would mistake for a warrior's at first glance. But his dress tells his stores as a scholar. So it was a mistake. He asked me when he saw me. I saw fear at the depth of his eyes. But there was also a stubborn ego and pride. A grave one. It was my mistake. My people had nothing to do with it. He said with earnest eyes. But I remained silent. He gritted his teeth before he got up from the throne and walked towards me. When he was in front of me. He dropped his crown and went on his knees. The kingdom of Dali was on its knees. He begged me, please. He probably thought that I was a madman who would be willing to kill everything to satiate his anger. Crazy I might be, but I was not that kind. I gave him a short nod before I took a step back. I raised my hand high and gathered a huge amount of Kai in my fist. Then I slammed it onto the ground as it caved in due to the force. Cracks spread throughout the castle made of stone and wood as it cried out, unable to bear the weight of my attack. It crumbled. The castle fell apart and broke down, burying its king in the darbies. Once the castle of a king, now it was a tomb. I broke through the darbies and shot out towards the sky. My next destination was the kingdom of Tang, and the crocodile king who imprisoned me, and later on tried to kill me. Third POV, one month later, it has been one month since the destruction of both the capital cities of Dali and Tang. The king of each respective kingdoms were buried along the city. After the destruction of Xiaguan city, Tai Long immediately went after Chang'an city, which was the capital of the kingdom of Tang. The same scenario played out as Tai Lung brought the consequences of provoking the strongest in the world. He raised the city to the ground and turned the capital into ash, before he took the head of the king of Tang, the crocodile king, and hung it on the gate outside the city. He was especially brutal with the crocodile king, because of the history between them. Before Tai Lung was imprisoned, he had faced the crocodile king in his mission to stop a great war. And when Ugwe decided to imprison Tai Lung, the King of Tang was the most active player to make that happen, due to his hate for Tai Lung. Suffice it to say, he deserved what was coming for him. A month had passed yet China had not settled into a peaceful state. The thousands of civilians whom Tai Lung spared, yet destroyed their homes, were left with nowhere to go. Even with their city destroyed, they dared not blame Tai Lung, and they shift all of their hatred towards their previous kings 
and their stupid decision to piss off someone who obviously should not be. Both kings went down as the most hated kings in history, especially the Crocodile King. But it was at this moment of helplessness and broken mental state, that Lord Shen came to them like an angel sent by the heavens. With their defeat in the war and their respective kings dead, the kingdom of Dali and Tang were absorbed into the unified China. Lord Shen had been busy managing the two kingdoms right after he was done settling things with the kingdom of Nanza. The people of both kingdoms were not as resistant to the new rule as you would expect. With their hatred for the previous king, it was not hard for them to leave their previous history behind and accept the new ruler. After all, it would be better to be under someone who befriend Tai Lung rather than make an enemy of him, right? That was the most important factors in everything. Tai Lung, after his achievement of repelling 200,000 soldiers and four great masters, Master Sloth, Altai Tiger, Turtle Monk and Mighty Eagle, and his frightening ability to destroy two capital cities in a day, and take over two kingdoms by himself, his status had elevated. His status was akin to that of a god. His influence alone was greater than any individual kingdom, and he had cemented his legacy in the history of China. In everyone's mind, he was someone on par with the likes of Uguay. He might not have as big of an impact overall, but Tai Lung was heavily involved with the matters of China, and he was still alive, both of which Uguay was not. People were in absolute awe and fear of him. He was deemed as insurmountable, like the sun in the sky and the disasters of this world. He was seen as something which no one could defy. The unification of China, which was thought to be only a possibility, had now become a certainty. If Tai Lung wanted to unify China, it would happen. The kings of the six remaining kingdoms dared not even think about fighting a war anymore. They were merely staying neutral, and were all waiting for things to settle down fully, so that they could surrender before the other kingdoms, in hopes of earning goodwill. This fact might come as a surprise to many people, but the kings could not be blamed. Tai Lung's feat of destroying two capitals and killing the kings in the span of one day, might only be one of the great achievements Tai Lung had made to most people, but for the kings, it was the most terrifying feat. It meant that Tai Lung was willing to break the codes of war. He would not hesitate to drop into their capital and destroy everything, while also killing each and every one of them. Even the kings were not safe. They were rightfully afraid. Further resistance was futile. They had watched it happen two times now, and they would be damned if they let themselves be the third. The fact that the kings of Dali and Tang were hated by their own people, and had their legacy destroyed, was also something the kings feared more than death. So as long as they would be spared and maybe allowed to continue their rule under the unification, they were willing to surrender and become the last kings of their kingdom. It was the end of an era. With his incredible strength, Tai Lung brought a new era to China. Welcome to the era of a unified China. Third POV. There better be a good reason why you have to summon me during my vacation. I said in a grumpy voice as I strode inside the throne room of the Tower of Sacred Place as if I owned the place. Which I did. Yes, sorry to disturb you during your vacation. How was the panda village? He asked me with a smile on his face as he sat on the throne which had a table. There were many schools and paper on the table including a map. It was good. I'm glad you failed to kill them all. They are cool people. Makes me almost want to hit you because of it. I said with a shrug and stood in front of him with my arms crossed. After the war was over, I thought it was high time I took a vacation where I could just relax and do some research on Kai. The panda village had always been on my mind, so I thought it was the perfect chance to visit it and have a vacation there. It took me a whole week to locate the village, even with my flying ability and the clues I still remembered from the third movie. It almost felt like the universe was hiding it, but in the end, I found it. After I found it, I had a talk with Poe where I basically tell him that his real father was alive, and that he was not the last panda in the world. A rather dramatic reaction followed, and soon enough everyone got to know that the pandas were still alive. I decided to take Poe with me on my vacation, and although I did not intend it, his father also tagged along. His offer of cooking for me as I am on vacation was too good to deny. We went to the Kung Fu Panda and Poe finally reunited with his family. I also tried to relax and rest for probably the first time in my life. The most I did was learn about Choi and meditation. Less than a week passed after that, and we suddenly had visitors, the Furious Five. They were sent by Shen with a message that an emergency had emerged, and he needed his general. Obviously, the secret Pab de Villa League was still a secret, and I would like it to stay that way, especially to the likes of Shen. Thus, why the Furious Five were sent here. Now, here I am, in my small defense. I was young at that time and fighting against a prophecy. You know how that goes. 
He said and I scoffed, as if you can defend yourself when you take the life of an innocent. I am not here to chat, get to the point. I said and tapped my foot on the floor. Shen paused and looked at me for a long time before he opened his mouth. His next words came slow, but they hit me like a train. The enemies have made a big move. What? I growled, they still dare to oppose us. Which kingdom is it? I will deal with it quickly. No, not that. He said with a shake of his head. Remember our main goal. He said and his wide eyes locked with mine. They challenged the seeds of insanity in mine. The other countries have made their move. He said, I got a message that there were movements from the Tibetan Empire and India. Third POV the world of Kung Fu Panda does not stop in China. Although only China was shown because it's the place where all of the main characters live, there exists the whole world outside it. China was considered a powerhouse of a country, and the only reason why its neighboring countries never saw it as a threat was because China was always busy fighting amongst themselves. But after the unification of China, everything changed. The emperors and kings from different countries were not oblivious. They all had is, and so they heard exactly what was happening in China. What started off as a fantasy was now brought to reality in the span of a year by the so-called strongest warrior in the world, the Supreme General Tai Lun. Yes, they have heard of him. There were many people around the world who wanted to test that title, and there were more who were wary and prepared to put an end to his life, especially for the Tibetan Empire. They were not new to the strength and might of Tai Lun, who had fought against them alone in their invasion of China. Rumor has it that he was even stronger now. The reactions to the change happening in China were different from ruler to ruler. While some saw an opportunity, the rest saw a threat if they let them grow. But their main objective seemed to all be aligned. If China was no longer fighting amongst themselves and destroying each other, then we have to destroy them. This train of thought came to be because of the stark fact that China was easily the most powerful country that housed the most powerhouse. Greed and fear were never a good combination. Tai Lung's POV movements. I asked, elaborate. My spies have noticed that India and Tibet are sending messages in convoys to each other. They are establishing friendly relations, and they are stationing their army closer and closer to our borders. He said and threw a scroll at me. I opened the scroll and read the contents. It was a detailed report of what was happening between the two countries. Driven by greed, eh? I asked and threw the scroll back at him as I was done reading. And fear. Shen added with a smile that looked oddly pleased. They think we are at our weakest, and they also know that if they allow us to grow, a unified China can take over their territory and overthrow their rule. They are correct in both assumptions. He said, China was at the weakest it had ever been, with internal conflicts and the chaotic aftermath of a new rule. And although it was said that China had been unified, it was not completely true. There are four remaining kingdoms which had yet to be brought under a rule. But it was only a short matter of time, and the unification was inevitable, so it was already said to be unified. It was actually not. It would take a year or two for that statement to be completely true. The Tibetan Empire had always been in conflict with China, and was always looking for an opportunity to expand its territory. So it was not a surprise that they wanted to attack China while it was at its weakest and try to grasp whatever it could gain in our times of chaos. Tibet on its own was not that much of a threat. But what if it allied with India and its conquest to invade China? Now that was a different beast entirely. Firstly Tibet and India were neighboring countries, and if they worked together, Tibet would be much stronger. Because it wouldn't have to worry about an attack from India, while it was invading China. This way, Tibet would be able to spare more military forces. And India by itself was probably the most powerful country in the world. Even more powerful than China in its current situation. Things were a little different in this world than in my previous world. The different regions of the world are still classified as countries. But each country has their own rulers. In the country of Tibet, there is the Tibetan Empire. In the country of India, there is the Gupta Empire. In the country of Europe, there is the Umayyad Empire. In the country of Korea, there is a new empire Cilia. And so on. Most of these countries are controlled by an empire. China was the old one when the country used to be constituted of 10 different kingdoms called the 10 Great Powers. Usually, different countries rarely get into conflict with each other, and they are busy in their own country. But these changes when one country is united under one banner. And when they were united, they wanted to expand their territory. Thus the conflict expanded into a world war. In specific, China was a coveted land with its richness and beautiful nature. So all the empires have always wanted a piece of China. Now that they had the chance, they will come after it. After all, what better time than now when China was at its weakest with its great protector Uguay's death? China was truly in its most vulnerable state. 
So what are we going to do? I asked Shen. I allied with him because of his political expertise and sharp mind, so I'll let him do his job. Shen shook his head, it's about what we are going to do. It's about what you need to do. Oh, I want you to be stationed on our southwestern border, so that you can slow down, or maybe even stop the invasion. That would inevitably come from India and Tibet. He said with careful words, I do not need help in taking the remaining kingdoms under our rule. We eclipse them in sheer numbers, and I can take care of any small invasion from the north and the east. They only consisted of small nomadic tribes. Korea is also only recently unified, therefore they would not attack. Our main problem is from Tibet and India, and I want you to be there to stop them. He said. I paused and I processed his words before I showed a smile. Seems simple enough. Yes. Especially if you went to the borders between India and Tibet and sow some conflicts. Make them distrustful of each other so that they won't ally. That way it would be easier. He suggested. On other days. I would scoff and say how cowardly and dishonorable it was. But if the last war had taught me anything, it was that there was no honor in a war. So I took the advice to heart as something which I can do. After that, we both had a long discussion about what his other plans for China were, and what his objectives would be while I was away. We also discussed when I would leave and how long I would need to stay there. In the end, we stopped our meeting when the sun had set. I shall leave in a month. Tai Lung's POV The meeting went well as expected, even though it was called an emergency meeting. It was called as such because Shen needed to make a major decision as quickly as possible and he won't do that without me. It was not because there was an urgent attack or anything like that. We talked about a lot of stuff which was mostly related to the military since I was the general. I didn't care much about other politics. One of the interesting things we talked about was the creation of mortars, which would be extremely useful in taking over the kingdoms in the north, which was a hilly region. Shen also said that he was in the middle of a project. Said project was making a giant airship to carry infantries who would be dropped to the battleground with the help of parachutes. On the issue of Tibet and India, there was nothing else to do other than sending the soldiers of Nanzhao to the borders to guard in case of an attack. There was not much information to work with. Nevertheless, issues such as two countries making an alliance takes time, so there was no need to rush. It was decided that I would leave after a month and until then, I could continue enjoying my vacation. I leapt down from the thorn room because God knew I was not going to climb down all those stairs. I landed on the ground in a controlled manner that barely made a sound. Then I left the grounds of the peacock and went to the city. The soldiers bowed at me with respect and admiration as I walked out. I no longer wore a cloak to hide myself as I walked through the districts of Gongman City. I held my nose high and my chest forward as I observed the city which we had fought hard to protect. The time of mourning was over, and the citizens who had left the city, fearing that it would be destroyed, had also returned and settled back. A sense of joy and security achievable only by winning a war filled the city. The citizens gathered around me, but they knew to stay far away and made a path for me. They admired me from the sides, whispering to themselves praises about me. My ears twitched as for the first time. I tried to hear everything they had to say. It felt good, but their admiration was also layered with a rightful amount of fear. Like a sailor gazing at the endless expanse of an ocean, awed at its infinite depth and calm, yet also being acutely aware that it could drown the world. From a rumored criminal and a villain, I became their hero, the warrior who fought against three kingdoms to protect them from harm. They were regretful of how they treated me in the past, and wondered if if there was anything they could do to make up for it. But they couldn't find an answer, so they stared from a distance not too far yet not too close. But then a young rabbit slipped away from the crowd, his tiny body and nimble frame, escaped his mother's grasp, and he ran towards me with a toy in his hand. Master Tai Lung, he called me with a huge smile that showed all his rabbit teeth. He did not know why the people were hesitating to approach me because he was too innocent. He only saw the good in the world, he only saw the good in me. The perspective he had was how I protected his home from a huge invasion. The number of soldiers I had to slaughter to protect never crossed his mind. Thank you for saving the city. He said with a bow. His feet tapped on the ground with excitement as I looked at the odd ball. Then my eye caught the toy he had in his hand. It was a figurine, like the ones Poe had in his room which consisted of the Furious Five. But this one was a figurine of me. Nice toy you got there. I said with a small smirk and a raised eyebrow. Thank you. This one is my favorite. He said and showed it to me. I didn't know why I felt proud to hear him say that. Really? But I see it's missing something. I said and took the toy from his hand. Then I made a small scar on his chest with my claws. See? I said and showed him the new scar on my chest. It was a claw mark left by Master White Tiger. The wound he made turned into a scar, because the poison had damaged it beyond normal injury. It was a mark of his dishonor, 
and also a proof of how I stood unfazed in front of deceit and tricks. Cool, he said, and quickly took his toy from my hand. He looked at it with wide, shining eyes. Then his mother hurriedly came to him and grabbed him by the hand, before pulling him away with a small apology. I just shook my head and waved at the little kid. I walked through the different districts, and when I was near the gate of the city, I leapt into the air and flew back towards the Panda Village. The Panda Village sits at the peak of the Rocky Mountains in the northeastern part of China. The region was filled with ice, and the low temperature made it, so that no vegetation could grow there. It was an isolated place where no one lives unless of course the pandas. The thick ice and constant snowstorms made it extremely difficult to find if you did not know what you were looking for. The Panda Village was surrounded by a towering barrier of mountains amidst a glacier. The village was built on the ground of a geothermal spring which melted the ice around the village. And it was for this reason, that the pandas could cultivate and live there. It was a hidden paradise, uncorrupted by the world outside. It made you wonder if the pandas as a species were favored by the universe itself for them to stumble upon such marvelous land. I made a beeline to the place as I propelled myself through the icy storm winds using flash steps. I landed on the entrance of the village with a soft thud, and I finally took a breath that did not chill my lungs. Warm air? Ha! Huh. I released a sigh and looked down from the small hill. From my position, I could get a perfect view of the panda village, and it was one of the most beautiful sight I had ever seen. It was something I would imagine when I think of heaven in my past life. The pandas were all farmers, and I could see some of them working diligently with a smile on their face. Even though it was located in a region that looked like Antarctica, the land of the panda village was fertile and bore great harvest even without much work. It was a land as precious as gold. I felt relaxed, not only in my body, but in spirit as I felt the wonderful Kai soothe my spurt. It was strange how the village was so abundant with Kai, and the quality was unlike I had never seen before. Maybe it had something to do with the pandas themselves rather than the land. I saw Tigris pulling down a tree from a distance. The tree bent down in ways it should not, and Tigris used it as a way to propel herself like a spring. Her body shot through the air and she landed right next to me. You're back. She said with a smile. Yes, it took less time than I thought it would. I responded. So what was it about? She asked in a curious tone as she stood next to me. Oh, nothing much. New enemies on the horizon, this time they are from Tibet and India. I said with a shrug. She gave me a complicated look, likely due to how carefree I was about it. So this does not bother you. Why should it bother me? I always have enemies. No, not that. She said, I mean they are from Tibet and India. I heard the armies of the Indian Gupta were vast and powerful. I chuckled as long as they bleed. I have no worries. It's the spirit warriors which I am wary of, not some vast and powerful soldiers. After all, their quantity and quality just meant that I had to put in a little more effort. Okay then, seems like I was worrying for nothing, she said. A pleasant silence before us as we just enjoyed the view of the village. My eyes caught the sight of Poe who was rolling down the mountain and constantly hitting either a rock or a tree. He was hurt each time, but his enthusiasm never left him as he tried again and again with his father. He was trying to discover who he was and and when he felt that he was getting there, it made him happy. He was a panda. I ducked my head as a bird flew past me with a gust of wind. I pulled my head back up and looked at Crane, who was flying in front of me. He was carrying a red blanket in his talons where multiple babies were wrapped. They giggled in childish joy. Oh, hi guys, he said and tipped his hat at us. Careful where you are flying, Crane. Tigress said immediately, concerned for my safety. You might hurt the babies. Or maybe not. I chuckled as I saw her serious face. She had gotten extremely close to the baby pandas in the village. They even called her Stripey Baby. Come join us, it's lunchtime. Crane invited us and he spun in the air to the joy of the babies. Then he flew away and towards the village again. I saw Poe and the rest of the pandas going back to the village as well where I smelt some good food. Shall we? Tigress said and gestured down the hill. Exclamation point question mark if you are trying to make me roll down the hill like a complete fool. Then I will ask you to stop. I said, offended at the mere idea. What? It's their customs and while we are here, we must respect it. She said, all too amused. I guess that made sense, as the saying goes when in Rome, do as the Romans do. But I was still not doing it. Don't tell me you haven't learned to roll yet. Poe is still learning it now even as a panda and the dragon warrior. Can you not do it? She asked. Cheat tricks. She was a decade too young if she thought she could make me do it with those words. I scoffed. But then she got low and swiped my feet off the ground. I saw it coming, but I chose not to stop it as I fell from my place and rolled down the hill. Well, if I was already rolling, 
I might as well commit and become the best at this thing. Later that week, in a rolling competition where the winner gets a hundred bowls of dumplings. I won against all the villagers, and defeated the dragon warrior again. Tai Lung dash 2, dragon warrior dash 0. Take that stupid fate. Third POV China was experiencing the biggest change in all of its history. Previously ruled by different tribes, kingdoms and empires. Now it was going to be united under one banner, under one rule. It was made possible by the alliance between the strongest warrior in the world, Tai Lung, and the genius prince of Gongmen City, Shen. They were a duo that would undoubtedly go down in history. For in the span of less than a year, they have achieved what their ancestors couldn't do for millennia. But such achievement was to be expected from those who dared dream of conquering the whole world. A new era had emerged in China. An era which was more peaceful and promising than the one before. It would be a common deduction to think that China would be at its weakest and struggling to adapt to the change of this new era. But such assumptions would be wrong. Instead of struggling to adapt, China and all its people were thriving in this new era. With Lord Shen's political genius and Tai Lung's godlike reputation, there was no trouble like most people would assume. Shen was extremely intelligent and cunning in his schemes, such that he was able to unite the kingdoms after their defeat without much trouble. Even the kingdoms which were at each other's throats the year before, had accepted being together. There was no revolt or internal conflicts. It was not that no one was opposed to the new rule, but they knew they couldn't do anything. Their idea to revolt and resist the new rule, diminished with each new achievements that Tai Lung made, until they thought to themselves, why bother? He was the strongest warrior. Their resistance was futile, so they just accepted their situation. No one wants to die a meaningless death after all. In return for this fear and respect for Tai Lung, Lord Shen's words which were the same as Tai Lung's because of their alliance were respected and taken with respect. They obeyed whatever orders they received. And with such obedience, Shen was able to achieve his goal which was the prosperity of China. The six kingdoms which were already united were thriving like never before. With the lack of constant wars and the need for vigilant soldiers at the borders, the roads and the cities were much safer. Most bandits dared not attack the merchants of the united China, so trade thrived. The economy of the kingdoms combined and morphed into something more than it ever was. The cities which were raised in Tai Lung's anger, were also being slowly rebuilt, and in a few years, would regain their prosperity. And the military might was not at an all-time low as the rulers outside of China might expect. Instead, it was quite opposite because of Tai Lung. The change happening in China seemed to be for good. In the tavern of one of the cities, a group of people were crowding near one specific table, as they wanted to hear what the guy sitting there had to say. It was a bear who was on the older side, and he was retelling an event which happened 23 years ago with vivid detail. And on that day, no one believed Tai Lung was going to triumph over Master Lishu. He was known for his unstoppable strength and impenetrable defense. He was a behemoth, a giant which no one thought would fall to the likes of a young warrior like Tai Lung. He said and his audience listened well. At the center of the city, the fight took place. All the citizens gathered to watch the fight because seeing Master Lishu fight was a privilege, and no one wanted to miss it. We made bets on how many hits Tai Lung would be able to take before he fell. I prayed that Tai Lung lasted at least a few hits, so that I would be able to admire Master Lishu's techniques. He said and paused. Everyone could already guess what happened next, but they wanted to hear it anyway. But we were also wrong. Tai Lung was able to defeat the unstoppable force. The warrior who supposedly had never fell with, but a single finger. The old bear said and showed off one finger. The audience oohed and aahed. One touch to make Master Lishu fall on his knees, peeing himself in fear. It was not a fight, it was public humiliation. He had boasted a title he should not have, he had claimed to be all-powerful. When he shared the land with Tai Lung, and he paid Dilly for it. A few years later, Master Lishu took his own life, unable to live with the shame. He finished the story. Whoa. So is that why his son, Master Wu Bao fought against Tai Lung after he broke out of prison? It was to take revenge. One of the audience said in realization as the crowd nodded, absorbing that small knowledge. So in the end, Wu Bao himself was the one causing the destruction of the city, and not Tai Lung. Duh. You think the Milan city will still stand today if he really went on a rampage? I am from Xiaguan so I can tell you. If he really went on a rampage, Milan would have suffered the same fate as we did. Complete annihilation. Everything I owned burned away in a single day. Thar's tough buddy. You must be angry at Tai Lung. Tai Lung. ETFF. Nah. I am angry at the stupid king who decided that it was a good idea to not only attempt to kill Tai Lung, 
but also break the codes of war to piss him off. The tavern bustles with discussions and activity. The tales of Tai Lung in his heydays which had died down after his imprisonment and almost seemed surpassed by fate began emerging again. Shen, who had spread bad words about Tai Lung before they became allies, did the opposite after their alliance, and tired to give a boost to Tai Lung's already high reputation. In the end he also benefited when Tai Lung was feared and respected, so he was also working on that. The spirit realm, a brilliant golden kai clashed with corrupted green in an explosion that destroyed the floating mass of land. The great land flew away in broken fragments everywhere. The spirit realm, meant to be the resting place of kung fu masters, was opposite to what it was supposed to be. It was hell, it was a hunting ground where the kung fu masters were prey, cursed to run away from the villain clad in green light. You are getting weaker, Ugwe Kai screamed and shot out like a missile towards Ugwe. Master Ugwe struggled but managed to dodge Kai, who whizzed past him and crashed into a flying mountain in the distance, destroying it. Kai had gotten more and more powerful. In the movies, he was not this strong while he was in the spirit realm. But due to Tai Lung's influence, more and more masters whose Kai he was supposed to get only after escaping the spirit realm, died, and gave Kai the opportunity to obtain them earlier. He was now as strong as he was when he faced Po in the movies. And I am only getting stronger. Kai said as he emerged from the derbies with a smile on his face. He had finally absorbed the Kai of all the Kung Fu masters who died in the War of Gongman City, which included Master Croc and Ox who died instantly in Mighty Eagle's attack. Alpha was also one of the Kai he absorbed. The spirit realm was not an afterlife where everyone can go. It was a place where mutated Kai which the universe could no longer recycle, went after they died. People with mutated Kai were mostly Kung Fu masters who had done so by dedicating their lives to their Kung Fu. There is no alternative where you come out as the victor. It is only a matter of time. He said and tugged at his chain and caught his green blades. Maybe, maybe not. Ugwe said with a small laugh that held no amusement. It was a mask to hide his worry. But at least I am not alone anymore, right dear nephew? Ugwe asked with a smile towards the turtle monk. Oh, don't bring me into this. Turtle monk said while scratching his head, floating beside Ugwe. He was not among the kung fu masters Kai absorbed because he was a monk, not a kung fu master. He could fight, but he rarely does. I don't see why we have to sacrifice our eternal peace to fight someone like him. Why not just send him directly to the final boss? Turtle Monk asked with a lazy stretch to his words. Tai Lung. Yeah, I'm sure he can deal with him, although it might take some effort. We are only making him stronger by keeping him here. Turtle Monk said. Igwe hung before closing his eyes. He sent his sense to the mortal realm where he saw the scene of Tai Lung, and the Furious Five, along with Po enjoying their time in the Panda Village, Tai Lung was trying to teach them how to utilize their Kai, but the pandas were very bad students. Or should he say Tai Lung was a bad teacher, he could only teach through hardcore training, and was new to teaching soft civilians. Tai Lung was also helping them grow their crops master, which was a way for him to practice the restoration side of his Kai, and every day was a huge feast due to the generous harvest. Igwe opened his eyes, let's give him some more time. How long is some more time? Question mark quote Turtle Monk asked. As long as we can. It was true that Kai was getting stronger. But Tai Lung himself was getting stronger faster than Kai. Igwe believed that given some more time, Tai Lung would be able to defeat Kai easily, instead of with some effort. There would be a higher chance of victory for Tai Lung, who was not meant to defeat Kai. At least as long as Kai remained the same strength he was in the movies. Tai Lung's POV. What are you? I asked Po as he sat cross-legged with his eyes closed. Are you the son of a goose? But he is not your real father, is he? I walked around him and whispered close to his ear. Are the son of a panda. But you've only known him for a month. His eyes twitched and shut tightly. I felt his breath hitched as he tried to find out exactly who he was. He was searching for answers. Answers which I could not tell him, answers which only he can find in himself. Are you a warrior? Like me? No. Are you the dragon warrior? You've been the dragon warrior for only a year. Are you not a noodle maker more than a warrior? Quote, I got no answer, and I saw his shoulder slump down ever so slightly, and her eyes became closely shut. He gave up. You want to harness the power of Kai. Yet you don't even know who you are. I said with a shake of my head. I was hoping that with my help and with him visiting the panda village earlier than in the movies, he would be able to master Kai quicker. But I guess maybe it's impossible to make such growth without an adversary. How do you do it? How do you find out who you were? Po asked me with earnest eyes. By being chained down at the bottom of a dark cave for 20 years. I said in a matter-of-fact tone. Oh, is there an easier way to master Kai? There is, and I am trying to teach you right now. I said, you are the dragon warrior. 
The universe is literally a simp for you so out of all the masters, you should have the least difficulty mastering Kai. I don't know what that means, but okay Po said with a smile. You can go now, but continue to ask yourself that question every moment of the day. Who are you? And when you find the answer, make sure you tell me. I said and gave him a small smile before I sent him away to play around in the village. Thank you Master Tai Lung. He waved at me as he ran, but then he tripped on his own leg and started rolling down the hill comically. Can't believe he is one of the strongest living masters in China. I said to myself in an amused smile. It was a humorous truth. I sat down on the ground and started doing my own meditation. But unlike Po, I was already proficient in using my Kai. Yet I still faced a problem of my own. Let's start with an undeniable fact about me. I learned from my battles. And there were three vital things that became apparent in my last battle. First was the fact that I was a horrible aerial fighter. Which made sense because it had been less than a year since I learned how to fly. So the fact that I was fucking pathetic in the air was no surprise. I was so weak in the air that Mighty Eagle was able to destroy me every second we fought. Some might think that it was not a serious issue. Since I was undoubtedly the strongest. But I knew it could be vital. Mighty Eagle was probably the strongest warrior in the sky. So it was exactly not fair to compare myself to him. But I knew there were other strong warriors like him all over China. If we include the world, there might be someone on par with him. So I needed to get stronger and train until I was as strong in the air as I was on land. The second thing I learned was that sometimes, I get too caught up with my own amusement and prioritized honor and dignity. All is fair in love and war. Just because there are some things I would never do as a warrior, doesn't mean that my enemies have the same morals. Especially when they are so unquestionably outmatched, it is easy for them to throw away all their morals and try to survive with everything they had. So I should stop holding back and expect deceit and trickery in every battle. The third and the most important thing I learned in my battle was I did not have nearly as much Kai as I thought I did. Don't get me wrong, I have a shit ton of Kai compared to other warriors. With one of my two Kai alone, I was already second to only Po when it comes to the quantity of Kai. But with my other Kai, I outclassed everyone else by a mile, and I was capable of fighting for days. That was the truth until I started developing techniques which I like to call army killing techniques. These are techniques that affect a large area like firebending, conquerors haki and even kamehameha. They took a great amount of kai to execute. If I used such techniques, I wouldn't even last a day. So in conclusion, as a warrior, I had more than enough kai. But as the supreme general who was supposed to go against an army even when outnumbered a hundred thousand to one, I was extremely lacking. With my future plan of world conquest on the horizon where I would undoubtedly have to go against even bigger armies. I needed to find a solution to enlarge my Kai reserves, or at least find an alternative. Which is very possible with my nigh infinite amount of knowledge of different worlds. I smiled. The strength of a hundred seals used by Tsunade Senju from Naruto. I said out loud as a chilling breeze from outside the village blew on my fur. That was one alternative I could use. Using the concept behind the hundred seals, I could maybe create something that I can use to store my excess Kai which I would then be able to use in battle. It didn't even have to be my own Kai. The world itself was made up of Kai. Surely I would be able to find a way to store that Kai and use it for myself given enough time. Kai was the fuel of the miracles after all. You only need a strong concept and enough willpower. We could even go further in that direction and try to control the Kai of the world. Something like Sage Mo from Naruto. And if I could use the Kai of the world, I would have infinite Kai. Or maybe I could take a note from Kai, and find a way to steal the Kai of the people I slay for myself. Store the Kai of my dead enemies to empower myself. So many possibilities. The only problem was finding the quickest way, my enemies nor the universe was going to wait for me to invent a technique to make myself literally invincible. One month was nearly not enough. I chewed on my lips as I contemplated what I should do. Third POV, after defeating the allied forces of the Three Kingdoms, Dali, Nanzhao, Tang Tai Lung, went to the hidden village of the pandas in the north to further his understanding of Kai. He also took his disciple, the dragon warrior, with him to help the young warrior in finding his true self. Shifu in the library of the Jade Palace, writing all of these on a scroll which was titled, The Life of Tai Lun. It was not the first time the Jade Palace had kept records of someone's life like this. These were important records that would be kept locked up, and would be later on used by historians to learn about the past. A small smile was permanent on Shifu's face, as he wrote about the life of his son. As his father and his teacher, 
He was someone who knew the most about Tai Lung. He had used the time his disciples went to the Panda Village as a chance to write these records. From the day he found Tai Lung until now, he was writing a detailed biography from his perspective. And like any father, he was extremely proud as he recalled the amazing feats and achievements his son had made. It didn't seem like his son would slow down in his achievements anytime soon, either. Tai Lung has become a household name in China. His title as the strongest warrior in the world and the 11th power of China was well known even outside of China. His name had become synonymous with power. The unification continued in China, but with Tai Lung's presence, there was no real resistance, only weak protest to protect their honor rather than their land. Shifu could not wait to see what his son would achieve next. He prayed that fate and destiny be kind to his dear son, and he will live until the end and watch his son change the world. Third POV, Gungmin City, the Tower of Sacred Flames. Lord Shen, the voice of Boss Wolf, echoed in the silence of the tower. The rapid sound of his footfalls came right after as he quickly climbed up the stairs that led to the throne room. Lord Shen he called again, much to the annoyance of Shen, who cringed at the disturbance. What is it? He asked in a not too friendly tone. It promised consequences if whatever news he brought with him was not an emergency. My lord. Boss Wolf slid to a stop right before the throne where Shen sat majestically. He had glasses in his eyes and he was reading a long scroll. And then in the silence came the shocking news. An army from Tibet is approaching our borders, Boss Wolf said with the utmost seriousness in his voice. What did you say? Our scouts have noticed an army of Tibet marching towards our borders in Nanzhao. Boss Wolf repeated himself, and Shen was forced to believe the news. It was completely illogical. Why did Tibet suddenly decide to attack them now? It has been only two weeks since he got the news that they were a threat, and he called an emergency meeting with Tai Lung. They were not supposed to move this fast. They were not supposed to have the nerve to attack them without the backing of India. Even if they were sure that they could win against China, they would be weakened enough in the war that the other empires would destroy them afterwards. And relations between countries or empires do not work that fast. It would require at least half a year of marriage between the sons and daughters of the respective emperor to have such quick alliances. By all logic and common sense in the world, this attack was absolutely unexpected. How many? Um, Boss Wolf said and scratched his head around 500 soldiers. Shen released a sigh he did not know he was holding before he quickly barked at him, stupid mutt, say that first. Sorry, my lord. 500 soldiers, huh? So that means that it was not an attack. There were around 3,000 soldiers stationed at the borders with multiple cannons on the walls surrounding it. So there was no way it could be an attack. So it was something else. Was it a message? A party sent for negotiation. Tell the commander stationed on the border to deal with them. Try to settle things peacefully. And even if they really are here for talk or negotiate, do not hesitate to bend a knee. We don't want to cause trouble now. Remember, we are the ones who need to buy time. Shen said to Boss Wolf who nodded after carefully listening. As you wish my lord. Boss Wolf said and bowed before he ran back down the stairs to send a message to the commander in charge of the borders. Shen shook his head as he watched his most trusted subordinate leave. He had nearly given him a heart attack, thinking Tibet had made a move so quickly. But it seemed it was nothing serious. Third POV, the Tibetan Empire, the borders of Tibet and China. You guys are not the brightest bunch, are you? The commander of China said with a shake of his head as he looked at the Tibetan army, who was taking out their weapons and getting ready to fight. They were 3,000 strong, while the enemy was only 500 in number. Yet they were trying to attack them here. The Tibetan army had asked for a talk a bit further into the Tibetan territory claiming that they do not feel safe so close to the wall where the cannons could fire at them. Getting the orders from Shen that he should try to not cause trouble, the commander decided that it was no harm to follow them and move away from the walls. After all, they were 500 while he had 3,000 soldiers with him. What could possibly have gone wrong? Soldiers get ready the enemy commander, a tiger with well-developed muscle and armor, said as the 500 soldiers slowly surrounded the bigger army. The FTT, I have heard of the arrogance of Tibet, but to think you guys are this delusional, said the commander of China, a giant gorilla. Fine, you guys shall die today, the gorilla said, and he took in a deep breath to puff out his chest. Then he beat it like a drum. We have tried our best to maintain peace, but the enemy has turned on us. Get ready, he said and the soldiers pulled out their swords and grabbed their spears horizontally at the lesser enemy, who was slowly surrounding them. Huh. The gorilla looked at the strange thing at the back of the Tibetan commander. It was a cage. But the odd thing about this cage was that it seemed to focus more on keeping people out than keeping someone in. It was also coated with a net-like steel structure, which would have made it impossible to snipe through with an arrow or other projectile. And inside the cage was someone. The gorilla could not see it properly, but it was a female who was heavily dressed. 
She was also holding a silver bell in her hand. It was an odd sight, something which the commander of Shen decided to ignore now that the enemy had surrounded them. Attack he screamed with the confidence of a victor. He was leading an army of 3,000, heavily outnumbering the enemy. It did not matter that the enemy surrounded them or that they were ambushed. They were going to slaughter some Tibetan cunts today. He led the attack and charged directly at the closest enemy. He brought up his war axe and was about to slash at the Tibetan soldiers. But something was wrong. Something deep down inside him knew that things were not as it was supposed to be. Ting ding ding the sound of a bell came from the cage. It was soft, but even amidst the war cry and the clatter of steel, they could hear it. Reality listened, and acknowledged the sound. Higher, the commander swung at the enemy soldier anyway. But he noticed something different. His limbs won't listen to him properly. They felt like noodles, a feeling you would experience right after waking up early in the morning. His muscles became rigid, and even as he swung his weapon, he lost his precision, and the enemy soldier was able to dodge his swing. What the? Gorilla muttered in disbelief, and the soldiers fought back. He tried to shrug off the sluggish feeling in his body, and exchanged some blows with them. But then it happened again. Ting ding ding this time, he felt heavier than before. Gravity became unkind to him as he felt his weight increase dramatically. The cruel pull of the earth made his movements slower and he was unable to dodge the slash that came his way. Their sword left a slash mark on his shoulder. Damn you. He screamed and using all his strength, he swung upwards, putting his injured shoulder to its final work. His swing connects this time and bisected the enemy soldier in half. I don't know what tricks you are using, but it won't work we are the soldiers of Tai Lung. He screamed and charged towards the enemy again. His soldiers followed. They had also felt the same negative effect as the bell rang, but they pushed through with sheer will. But it happened again. Ting ding ding air becomes thick. They could not get a proper breath, because each breath was full of carbon. It felt like oxygen itself was avoiding them, and each breath was not relieving. It was not noticeable at first, but then a few minutes later, they were out of their breath. Without the necessary oxygen, they were already getting tired. Ha 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 ha, not so tough now, huh? The commander of Tibet laughed as he looked at them. Ting ding ding gorilla anticipated another weakness, but this time, he felt no change. The soldiers of China, thinking that the enemy had run out of tricks, rushed at the Tibets with new hope. The commander gorilla swung his weapon, ready to chop off the heads of these outsiders. But then a strange sight greeted him. Kling. Somehow, the enemy blocked his attack. It was a feat which they were not able to do until now. Then it hit him. This time they did not get weaker, but the enemy got stronger. Ting ding ding swoosh. The soldier's spear whizzed right past his cheek at a speed much faster than before. The attack seemed to be blessed by the air itself as it made a swift cutting sound. The fight continued between the 3000 Stong Chinese army and the 500 Tibetan army. But with each sound of the bell, the army of Shen and Tai Lung was getting beaten worse and worse. At one point, it felt like a dream to them. A dream where they couldn't hit as hard as they wanted, where they couldn't run as fast as they wanted, where all their efforts were squashed. They were cursed by the world. Yet their enemy got stronger and stronger, like a dreaded nightmare. It's you. The gorilla screamed, and after gathering all of his final strength, he pushed through the enemy lines, and made a beeline straight to the cage and the female inside. If he could kill her, maybe this strange phenomenon would stop. He was able to catch her image. She had white ears and tails which were barely similar to that of the Supreme General, but her face and limbs were all covered by clothes. She shook her silver bell. Ting ding ding gravity pulled him down harder, trying to subdue him. He lost his footing due to the sudden change in weight, and he stumbled. Right then, the enemy commander came to him and plunged a sword through his heart. I'm gonna die. The words rang in his mind as crimson blood spilled out his chest. But he didn't want to go down so easily. He gathered all of his remaining strength, and he was about to lash out at the enemy commander, but ting ding ding the world forbade him. All of his strength left him as he went limp like a corpse. The last thing he saw was the cruel smile of the enemy commander. His tiger face filled with amusement, and his soldiers were losing the battle with the lesser army. Their frustrated scream filled his ears, and the sound of steel clashing steel pissed his eardrum. Kill them all! Then the commander's world went dark as death claimed him. Third POV. The 500-strong Tibetan army completely annihilated the soldiers stationed at the border. They lured them out first with the promise of negotiation, and then surrounded them. All 3,000 soldiers were killed in this short battle that went on for only a few hours. They had never faced an opponent like them before, 
so they could not even react properly. The Tibetan army went to the walls after the battle, and there were a few soldiers remaining on the walls. But they were easily subjugated, and then the Tibet soldiers got the gunpowder and cannons stationed at the walls. That was their main objective. They returned as soon as possible to avoid any reinforcement. They had done what they had come to do which was to steal the technology of gunpowder and cannons from the Chinese. It would not be easy to replicate it, but as long as they knew the weakness and have a general idea of how their weapons worked, they would be able to come up with counterattacks. That's what the Emperor of Tibet wanted. They returned to the main city of Tibet with their quest being a complete success. Gongmen City, Tower of Sacred Flames. What? Shen said with wide insane eyes that were bloodshot due to the intense emotion he was feeling. The atmosphere in the room froze under his crazed eyes as the people inside the throne room looked down in old fear. My lord, the soldiers stationed on the borders of Nanzhao had been annihilated, and the Tibetan soldiers took all of the cannons and gunpowder kept in the walls. His eyelid twitched and he felt his heart boil in a silence rage, seething at himself. He was angry, not at anyone else, but at himself. How ridiculous, how fucking pathetic. With Tai Lung by his side, he had gotten too used to winning. He rarely faced any challenges, and Tai Lung was the one who overcame all the odds. He had gotten lazy, and when it was his turn, he couldn't even complete a simple thing. He should have known not to underestimate his enemies. That was how he got to where he was in the first place because people underestimated him. He should have known better. It's unacceptable. My lord, what shall we do? Should contact General Dash No, He yelled at his subjects. They can't keep on turning to Tai Lung when things go wrong. They need to learn how to deal with things themselves. He was allied with Tai Lung. He was not supposed to be the only one doing all the hard work. Shen had promised a month's vacation to Tai Lung, and he will not go back to his words. He will deal with the situation himself. He had been taking things too slowly. Even until now, the Four Kingdoms had not been subjugated, and China was not truly unified. He thought he would take it slow, try and incorporate a proper system for a unified China first. But now he realizes that was a mistake. He can't take things slow. He did not have such privilege when enemies were surrounding him like a pack of hungry hyenas. He had to continue the momentum until he completed his final objective. He can't stop midway to take a rest or take it slow. Third POV, you have all done a great job in defeating the army of China and bringing home the weapons of black power. To celebrate, I shall throw a feast for everyone, the emperor of Tibet said with a wide smile on his face. He was a Tibetan antelope, otherwise known as Chiru, and he had inherited his throne from his father, who inherited it from his father. The Tibetan Empire is a long-standing dynasty that has existed for many generations. The Tibetan Empire was not big when it came to territory. The empire was only the size of three great kingdoms of China. Since they were so close to China, they were also influenced by Kung Fu and the teachings of Master Ugui. So there were many Kung Fu masters as well in Tibet. Of course, these masters were not up to the caliber when compared to China. But like every empire, they also have their own strength which they rely on to overcome their enemies. The castle of Tibet was abuzz with activities due to the small victory they had over China. It might not seem like much at first, but the victory meant a lot for the Tibetans. They finally got an overwhelming victory against China which they considered to be some kind of a wall they must overcome. Then they also got the weapons which was rumored to be powerful, and the main factors that contributed to the unification of China. So it was a great news, deserving a celebration for the emperor, the nobles and the soldiers. As all the celebration was going on, the main reason why the army of Tibet was able to win in the first place, looked at everything from the side. She simply stood at one corner of the room, and as if she was carrying an infectious disease, there was no one around her in 10 feet radius. Although the room was quite crowded with the party and celebration, no one approached her. The most she got was a disdainful look or eyes of pity directed at her. She wore a mask and almost every inch of her body was covered in clothes. But if her eyes were to be revealed, they must be sad and lonely. The loneliest place was a room full of people. She had gotten used to it though. At least they were not treating her horribly or constantly go out of their way to bully her anymore. She was an important asset. They may not like her, but they knew she was vital for the strength of this empire. She was the single most important factor for the military of Tibet. At one point, she could no longer bear to stay, and she walked out of the celebration hall. Her silver bell strapped on her waist made a soft jiggle sound as she walked through the hall of the castle. The main castle of the Tibet Empire was located at the peak of a mountain, and unlike the Chinese, it was made up of entirely stones and rocks. You could see some similarities between the cultures, but at the same time, they were vastly different. She had lived most of her life in this castle, but it did not feel like home. Two guards constantly followed her as she walked through the corridors. 
They were guards assigned to protect her at all times, because out of all the animals in the world, she was extraordinarily fragile. She was so weak that any average soldier could easily kill her, so she needed constant security. It was one of the reasons why she was not respected as she should be even though she was the most important person in the Tibet military. Her strength was not her own, she only had the ability to make others strong. She reached her room at last, and she walked in swiftly. The guards did not follow her inside, and they stood guard beside her door. Now that she was alone in her room, she felt a little at ease and her posture visibly relaxed. Her room was quite large as she spent most of her time there. It was like any other room you would expect from a young snow leopard. But unfortunately, she was not just any snow leopard. May. That was the name her parents had given to her. It directly translates to beautiful. She wondered how they could give her such name or when she was anything but. She finally took off her clothes as the baggy fabric fell on the floor. She swiftly discarded all other clothes she wore, such as her boots and gloves, until finally, she took off her mask. Her true appearance was finally revealed in the isolated room. Her ears twitched and her long tail twirled behind her. These were where her leopard characteristics ended. A beautiful long silver hair flows down like an avalanche from the top of her head to her waist. Yes, it was not a fur, but plentiful locks of hair on her head. In fact, there was not a single fur on her body. She only had pale white skin that held no blemishes. Her pale complexion hints that her skin never had much contact with the sun, always having to be hidden under baggy clothes. Instead of paws and claws, she had long dainty fingers and a nice pair of feet at the end of her limbs. Her body was unlike anything anyone had ever seen before. Her body was not built to be strong. It had the delicate shape of an herglis with long legs and unnecessary mounds of flesh on its top and bottom. Her boobs and butt. Indeed, she was not just a leopard. She was also a human. More human than a leopard. She possesses the fragile body of a human girl. Strength was beauty in this world. All animals have bodies that were designed to be exceptionally strong with each species having more impressive attributes than others. That exceptional design of strength was what made them beautiful. But the human body was fragile and weak. Strength seemed to be the last thing on the creator's mind while making the human body. It was fragile and weak. It had fur, no claws, no fangs, no beak, no hide, no nothing. In a world where strength was beauty, the human body might as well be the ugliest of them all. May's body was the same way. From the shape of her body to the way her muscles were developed, you could tell that she was weak. She had fat on her thighs, chest and bottom, which would undoubtedly hinder her movement. And her skin, they were furless. Yet they were not scales nor a hide. They were sensitive and soft. She wrapped her tails around her body and wondered why she couldn't just be a complete leopard rather than a human. Humans were looked down upon, not only because they were considered ugly and weak by others, but because a human was always associated with slaves. But it's been 20 years, and she has gotten used to it. She flopped down on her bed and stared at the stone ceiling above. She closed her eyes as the fond memory of her father played in her mind. If I am gone in the future, travel north. And you will a place there where you will be accepted just as you are. It will be your home. Go find it. She wondered if what her human father said was true. Or if it was just a lie he told to reassure her that she would be fine even after he was gone. She wanted to go north and see if what her father said was real or not. But the guards outside her room were not only there to protect her, but to also keep her from running away. After all, how could they possibly allow an asset like her to run away? Maybe that was why the stone castle never felt like home to her. Because it was also a prison. Tai Lung's POV the icy land of the north was not kind. The icy blankets of snow covered the entire landscape. Mountains were nothing but huge pillars of ice. And the sun never shared its warmth. The land was cursed. There was no life in this land for it snuffed out any spark of life in its endless depth of cold. A perpetual blizzard describes the climate of this land, and instead of the cycle of seasons, there was only eternal winter. I have forgotten the sensation of warmth the moment I left the panda village. Yet, I was able to traverse such a chilling landscape due to my species. I was designed to live in such a harsh climate to survive in the unforgiving cold. The frigid bite of the air could not penetrate my fur and I released a thawing breath as I finally reached my destination. Nowhere? It was not a name. I was literally in the middle of nowhere. This is such a bad idea. I said to myself as I looked around at the endless expanse of white and everything that was not warm. A bad idea. But I couldn't think of any other way to get my training done. The panda village was too nice and relaxing that I could not focus on training. It was nearly the end of my month-long vacation, and I had to get my mind ready to face the challenges ahead. 
The fact that I got a message from Shen which informed me of what happened at the border of Nanzhao also played a factor. A small army of 500 soldiers was able to defeat an army of 3,000 soldiers. It was either the smaller army was exceptionally strong, or the bigger army was laughably weak. I have fought against the soldiers of Nanzhao, so I knew it was not the latter. That means the smaller army the Tibetan soldiers were exceptionally strong. How strong exactly? I did not know, but I was going to prepare that's for certain. I did not exactly know how as I have no concrete plan, but what I was doing was the first thing that came to my mind. It was similar to how I would take an ice bath for training my body, and to sharpen my mind in my past life. I sat down on the icy plain and crossed my legs. Then I cleared my mind and mediated under the harsh weather of constant snowstorms and numbing blizzards. I meditated. I would have liked to say I cultivated, but there was no such thing. I did not know how long had passed, there was no sun to tell the time. I did mental training, reviewing my past battles and coming up with new ways I could fight. Mental training was one of the most important training. It was said to be superior to physical training at a certain point, and Ugwe often favored it over the latter. In such a violent and unwelcoming environment, the Kai also felt a little different as I used inner Kai to interact with the surrounding Kai. I also tried to come up with solutions to my problem of not having the amount of Kai I desired. Storing Kai, while it could work, did not suit my taste due to its limitations. Higher, I released a sigh. Then I started using some breathing as I felt a chill run down my spine. My body heat rose sharply and released a visible vapor. I think that's enough. Mental training and mediation are not really my thing. I learn better with action. Like during a sparring or in the middle of battle. That's when my genius really shone. Vuel flames erupted from my body and challenged the endless expanse of frigid ice. My flames were like hungry beasts as they grew hotter and bigger. The land experiences a rare occasion of hot versus cold. The cold which had reigned over the land for hundreds of years, witnessed the birth of searing flames. I felt my fur getting wet as the ice I sat on melts into water. I increased the heat of my flames as they turned blue, and they released a constant force of shockwave that pushed away the melted ice from flooding my place. Let's test a theory of mine, shall we? I said with a wide smile as I inhaled the hot air around me which further boosted my flames. Can you increase your Kai by using everything and allowing it to recover? Basically overexerting it, like the muscles. I said and raised my hand, the flames rose too. A weird phenomenon took place, where the icy landscape of the north experienced heat for the first time. My fire rose to a frightening degree even while battling with the natural climate, and could be seen from miles away. The place turned into a foggy land where water vapor occupied the whole place. A bright blue and yellow dome of heat was visible. I did so until I ran out of Kai. Test completed, you can expand your Kai, but the result is pathetically weak. This may differ due to age, I suspect that a growing child or teenager would show better results, but for me, it's not worth it. I said as I lay in the middle of nowhere. I passed out after I used up all of my Kai, and only woke up half a day later. Although my instincts would have protected me from death, it was not wise to use up all your Kai like that, especially when you have no one around you. Considering all the effort I put in, the result was not worth it. For comparison, if my Kai was 1 million, after exhaustion my Kai and recovery, it increased by 0.1. If I was not extremely acute with my Kai, it would have been impossible to tell the difference. So it's official that trying to increase my Kai like this was useless. Test number 2. I said with a smile, there are a few days left until I finally have to start conquering the world. During that time, I must put my mind back to training and become ready to take on the world. I will find a way eventually. After all, I am Tai Lung. Oh my care. Third POV in the unforgiving lands of the frigid north, Tai Lung was training for the next chapter of his conquest. He was preparing himself on that lonesome winter to challenge the world. A giant he may be, but the world was bigger. It would not be an easy feat, it would be the greatest test of his strength and legacy. He would come out of this, either with eternal glory or as a corpse, one of the many who failed to claim the world as their own. But as he was training in the middle of a blizzard, a weird sound caught his sensitive ears. It sounded unnatural, which was a surprise, since the place should be completely void of life. Though oh, it sounded like a drop of water, a small wave in a still body of water. The sound held a grave weight to it, as if reality had been punctured. Followed by, I hate you you fucking bastard a scream. Followed by many other curses that should never be put into words. Tai Lung got up and looked towards the direction of the sound which was above. Whoever was cursing so loudly was in the middle of falling from the sky. 
He made a quick calculation of the distance, and where the person was going to fall, and Tai Lung blitzed towards that location. He reached the place even before the person who was falling reached the ground. He hid behind a mound of snow, his white fur acted as a natural camouflage, and he stayed still and silent like the feline he was. The person crashed into the snow at last. He fell head first on the white blanket of snow, and remained there for a few seconds, until the cold bit against his skin. The person took a deep breath and rolled on his back. Holy shit I thought I was gonna die. It was then that Tai Lung got the surprise of his life. The person who had fallen from the sky, had no fur on his body, and with the memories of his past life, he could tell that it was a human. A man, to be exact. A man wearing clothes which did not suit the weather. He had messy purple hair which was barely visible as snow was stuck on it. One other thing Tai Lung noted was that the man was a looker by human standards. Tai Lung was surprised, and he decided to lie low and observe in silence. I told you, didn't I? It would only feel like you fell into a pillow. I brace, yeah. And you know that how? Frozen? Duh. Anna said so. I brace, I hate you. You would do well to be respectful to your own author. I brace PFTT. What will you do? Well, I can always start by changing the tag from comedy to tragedy. I brace, I'm sorry. Well you bet dash, is what I would have said if I didn't know you can't write proper tragedy, and you will lose lots of your readers if you did that. He laughed by himself. Is he mental? Tai Lung thought to himself as he observed the strange human who started talking to himself and laughing in the middle of nowhere. This was because Tai Lung couldn't hear the author's voice, which only the person can hear. To Tai Lung, it seemed like a madman talking to himself. Nevertheless, Tai Lung continued observing. So, the man said and quickly stood up while dusting off the snow. Where are we? I said it before, I don't know. The world you will land in is completely random. I can only choose what tier the world is going to be. I brace you said you didn't know where we were going. But now we are here. Yet you still don't know where we are. The man said with a sigh, some author you are. The man looked around the surroundings very carefully, and to Tai Lung's odd surprise, he noticed him immediately. Um, millimeters, the man froze like the surrounding ice, and his eyes remained locked on Tai Lung. Since his cover was blown, Tai Lung decided to stop hiding, and he slowly walked out. He strode confidently towards the old man. Is that what I think it is? The man said, still frozen on his spot as Tai Lung approached. Yes. I think he is a walking cat. The man gasped. What? No. That dash Tai Lung froze, a cat. He didn't know what he should feel. The words were offensive, but the intention behind it was genuine wonder and a tinge of excitement. It talks to, now the man was full on excited like a kid receiving a Christmas present. Shut up, Mothafuka. He will kill you. The author warned inside his mind. That's Tai Lung. Who? Tai Lung. From that panda kung fu movie. Oh. His eyes widen in realization before his body tenses and he immediately creates distance. Tai Lung carefully eyed the young man as he moved away with impressive footwork. A madman he may be, but Tai Lung realized that he was also a kung fu master. Why the fuck am I in panda kung fu? You promised me adventures and beautiful heroines not fucking furries. The man cursed, and why is he here? Shouldn't he be in prison? Ha! Huh. You know who I am. Tai Lung raised an eyebrow when the man asked why he was here, and why he was not in prison. Those were the only things he understood from the crazed ranting which was almost incoherent in his ears. The man stopped ranting and focused back on him. I do. You are Tai Lung, the son of Shifu and a warrior turned villain. He said, I should warn you though, I am the main character. So even if you are stronger, you can't win. Tai Lung stood there, dumbfounded at the man. Was he genuinely crazy and retarded? Who are you? Tai Lung also asked in return. Me, the man said, still cautious. I am Yuito Fujita, the main character. You've said that before. Well, important things need to be said twice. The man huffed telling himself that he was the main character, so he would probably survive this confrontation even if it became violent. He was being Delulu, but that was the only way he could stay calm at the moment. What kind of shitty luck does he have? The moment he dropped into a new world he met with the main villain. Can you fight? Tai Lung asked with a smirk as he observed the man's experienced stance. Western Mark Yuito thought carefully for a moment. No. Swoosh. Tai Lung blitzes at Yuito. His eyes widened for a moment before his body moved with the grace of water even in his panicked state. He blocked the punch, but he slid a few meters away. Lies. Tai Lung said. He had just attacked him with the speed of flash steps. But the man was able to react. Even Tigress might not be able to react to such a sudden attack. You can fight. Holy shit. Yuito was having a mental breakdown. He barely reacted with the help of Ultra Insect and Animal Instincts coupled with bullet time. He felt his heart thumping loudly. Speed was always his forte. 
but he could not catch up with that speed at all. Before we do this Yuido said and compose himself. I have pregnant wives at home, six of them, and I have a baby. Tai Long looked at him weirdly. Did the man really tell him that? Hoping for mercy. And you tell me this because, just letting you know that I have people back home who needs me and depends on me. Quote Yuito said, and his face tensed and became serious. So I can't lose. No matter what. Was that supposed to be scary? Tai Lung asked. No. But this is Yuito said, and moved his limbs in a hypnotic way that imitates water. I have dad's strength, and I will show you which one of us was made in the image of God. Yuito said his scary line. Wait Yuito you don't have to worry. I finally realized where we are after seeing him use falsettos. I brace, huh? Either we were in Panda Kung Fu. Yes, we are, but not the original. We are in a fan fiction of that world. And it also happens to be my other book. He is a good person unlike the original. I brace, I see. Yuito said with a nod and his posture relaxed. Tai Lung was again surprised at that. Who the fuck remained cautious when they met a stranger but relaxed after he was attacked? What an odd man. So you're a nice guy too. That's good to know. Yuito said and wiped a sweat. Well, nice to meet a fellow victim of the author, Yuito said with a wave. He was relaxed now, maybe too relaxed. Or, show some respect, Jude. His book did miles better than yours did. I brace what? Yuito scoffed impossible. The readers love me. Yeah. His story brought me to number one rank in the first week while I got hundreds one star reviews which I have to constantly delete on your first week. I brace Yuito laughs. It's not funny. I brace, I do not know what is wrong with you, but you can fight. I want to test how strong humans are. Tai Lung said, a spa. Yuito shrugged okay. Yuito was much relaxed, now that he knew he was not facing the main villain and instead a fellow MC. The author also said he was safe, so he took his words on it. After all, he didn't get hurt falling from the sky last time. Yuito got into position. As a battle manic, he would love the thrill of fighting a non-human like Tai Lun. It would be his first time as well. As long as his life was not threatened. Because unlike his heydays, reckless days, his life was not only his own, it was also theirs. Okay, a spa then, using only our body. No plot armor allowed. Yuito said and got into a stance of water stream rock smashing fist. That actually got a chuckle from Tai Lung, who was weirdly fond of the madman. This is good. It's your first fight outside your universe so the limiter on your special skill should also be lifted. This means you can grow stronger. Much faster we will have to leave afterward though. This is not where we want the second book to start. It will be a fan fiction of a fan fiction, which is just messy. I brace Yuito got more hyped up hearing that. Then the fight between the two main characters started. No plot armor, they only used their fists. This was great for Yuito cause his plot armor would never be able to contend against the Chinese plot armor anyway. Boom, a while later, oh I think I get it now. Yuito said as he wiped his bloody nose. Is this how you do it? Boom. So, thank you dear listener for reaching the end of this episode. Here is an important update. At the time of making this video, I've caught up to the latest chapter of this fic. Meaning, if you want to be up to date with what's going in the story, you'll have to check the story for yourself on web novel, link to the story is in the description below. I'll be waiting for the author to post more chapters, so this series will go on a short hiatus. Subscribe to the channel, like the video and all that jazz, so that the algorithm can show me some love. See you in the next one. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.